next, the Waco investigation, a hearing on the 51-day standoff at the Branch Davidian compound outside Waco, Texas. Chairing the joint hearing, Republican Bill Zeliff of New Hampshire and Republican Bill McCollum of Florida. This part of the event runs two hours and 20 minutes. Joint hearings of the Oversight Subcommittee on National Security, International Affairs, and Criminal Justice and the Judiciary Subcommittee on Crime will now come to order. I have a parliamentary inquiry. Please, please state your uh, nature of your inquiry. Mr. Chairman, for the last three days, some of us who are concerned about the integrity of these hearings and about the cloud that uh, still hangs over the involvement of the National Rifle Association, have uh, requested that NRA individuals who were surreptitiously Would the gentleman state his uh, parliamentary inquiry? I am, I am attempting to, and I hope uh, the chairman will not attempt to muzzle me. I would like to state an inquiry and I would like to do so uninterrupted. For the last three days, we have requested that NRA individuals who were surreptitiously involved in the preparation of these hearings, and there is a New York Times story which I think you would wish to address because it goes directly to your involvement. The gentleman is not stating a parliamentary I am parliamentary stating my inquiry. parliamentary inquiry. We were told by uh, the chairman yesterday and by you that you will consult with your leadership before you respond to our request that NRA officials involved in the preparation of this hearing be invited and uh, testify under oath. My inquiry, Mr. Chairman, is at what point uh, will uh, this happen? We will, uh, we discussed uh, uh, with the leadership uh, the decision that we made uh, relative to that request and uh, they have concurred with our judgment. Uh, we are not going to uh, have subpoenas of either NRA or other outside groups. We're really here to get at the bottom of what happened at Waco um, and that's what we're going to do. Mr. Chairman, I have not used this term until now, but now I'm afraid we are confronting a cover-up. The cover-up of the involvement of the National Rifle Association in the preparation of this hearing, which I think is most regrettable, and I hope you will reconsider your decision. Thank you. I, I, I don't believe you're stating a parliamentary inquiry, but I think we need to move on. Chairman, I, state your parliamentary inquiry. I presented to uh, you, uh, Chairman Zeliff and uh, Chairman McCullum, a request uh, this week. And I, too, am concerned about the impact of outside influence on the integrity of these hearings. Uh, specifically, uh, I've expressed grave concern about the potential imperable uh, I'm sorry, uh, irreparable contamination, contamination of the hearings and uh, by what I consider very uh, serious uh, and questionable actions of the Clinton administration, okay. I, I have to say staff that members that and, and the Democratic minority. Mr. And Micah, I've presented to you a state request. Your parliamentary inquiry. Well, I have presented to you a request uh, for subpoenas uh, for Mr. Podesta, uh, who is a counsel to the president, and uh, uh, for other administration officials who I believe are involved in a cover-up. And if the minority insists on subpoenaing and expanding uh, the content of this hearing, I insist that action be taken on my request, and that's my parliamentary inquiry is, when there, will there be action to see that uh, the outside influences
Okay. And, and the concerted effort by the administration and their officials uh, to cover up uh, what's Micah. going on uh, on their side of the aisle and what, what the administration is doing. When is that going to be addressed, Mr. Micah, sir? the same thing applies. Uh, we are not going to get involved with uh, subpoenas of outside uh, interest of any kind at this point. I'll give what you another like copy of on. my request, sir. Thank and you. I've uh, also uh, extended... Can we, can we make a trade, a one-for-one -one trade with a player to be named later? I think uh, that, we'll that little bit of we'll humor is very welcome, Mrs. Schumer. Uh, thank well, you very much for setting the stage for cooperation. What I'll we'd like to do to now do is uh, I'd like to just finish opening, if we can, with some very important witnesses that, that we'd like to get to at this point that, that certainly have come from pretty far away. We respect their time. Um, I'd like to welcome the public, my friends on the oversight and judiciary subcommittees, and our full committee chairs and ranking members. Also, I'd like to welcome our co-chairman, during these hearings, Chairman Bill McCollum of Florida. I know he's enjoying these marathon hearings. Uh, 12 or 13 hours didn't move out of that chair last night. Um, but we are making some good progress. Uh, for all those present, today is the third day of congressional oversight hearings in the executive branch conduct involving the 1993 confrontation with the Branch Davidians near Waco, Texas. These hearings will host almost 100 witnesses. These are the result of an extraordinary effort on the part of all participating members and are intended to address basic government agency accountability in addition to helping all of us understand better what happened at Waco and why, particularly on or near February 28th and April 19th. These hearings are, as we have stated on both sides of the aisle, unswervingly devoted to one task, finding the truth and fairly presenting it to the American people. Since we had some difficulty getting concurrence on an agreement previously reached by the majority and minority leadership, uh, we will proceed according to the five-minute rule today as we did yesterday. I should also explain that I'm in the chair today as a result of an agreement between Chairman McCollum and myself. Over the eight days of hearings, we are swapping the duties of the chair on a daily basis. By separate agreement, we are today in the Judiciary's Room and will be in the Government Oversight Room on Monday. We now move to opening statements. I'll also mention that by, by agreement of all, uh, we will forego a break in terms of lunch. We'll work right through. We're hopeful that we can get our business done with both panels by 3 o'clock. We're going to be hearing uh, an opening statements um, from the majority subcommittee chairs, then minority ranking members. And, um, and then after that's completed, we'll introduce the uh, first panel. Um, I will start with the first opening statement. Our purpose as uh, men and women of conscience and goodwill, as members of Congress who are designed the difficult task of true and thorough oversight of our government agencies, is to seek the truth without hesitating, recognize it, and make sure it is understood. That is the goal of good oversight. We have spent too much time already professing what these hearings are not about. Their innate fairness, despite the difficult and emotional subject matter, should be apparent now to all Americans. We have heard from those who knew David Koresh, from those who conducted the initial ATF investigation, from the prosecutors who charged the surviving Davidians, those who escaped the fire, and from ATF line agents, commanders, and a deputy director during the ill-fated February 28, 1993 assault. We have heard from legal experts, investigative journalists, representatives of the elite anti-drug special forces uh, that from which ATF requested special training, and from a host of other relevant sources of information. I do not personally think we could be conducting these hearings more fairly or methodically or inclusively. While we open with regrettable friction, there has been vigorous questioning of witnesses. In addition to the facts that got shaken out the first day, we learned yesterday that an agent in charge of the raid says he never thought he had lost the element of surprise, which is why he ordered the raid to go ahead. The direct conflict between his testimony and other credible testimony sets up additional concerns and questions. We are listening and trying to make sense of it all, and that I hope is what all interested Americans are doing as well, as a schedule of the very best witnesses come before us today in the days ahead. If this were a baseball game, we'd be in two innings into it out of nine in total. We'd be much less than halfway to our seventh inning stretch. We're just getting underway. Moreover, there is little joy in this process. The events and the questions themselves are very sad. In the events at Waco, in the botch raid, in its fallout, we lost more than 80 American lives, four young ATF agents who fell in the line of duty, a duty to serve us faithfully and to keep us secure. These hearings aim to keep faith with those agents and their families and their loved ones. We cannot bring them back, but we can look long and hard at what caused them to fall. The 
And when all the rhetoric is over, I really think that's why so many of us are drawn to these hearings. We want to know how did it all happen. And we want to know why also 51 days later, not 50, not 52, someone lost patience and launched large volumes of CS gas in a residence with 22 children inside. A residence that soon caught fire and in 15 minutes burned up all 22 children and their 60 or more company of adults. That too is an unmitigated tragedy. It scalds the soul and makes a decent person's heart heavy. Somehow you sit and feel overcome with regret that we couldn't have prevented all of this. Do we really stop child abuse by ending the child's life prematurely? Isn't there a better way? Shouldn't we have been more careful? What would it have cost to wait it out? Did good judgment get clouded by other concerns? We have to ask these difficult questions. The conscience of America calls out to us for answers. Coming back to details, we have come up with some important answers. There were some important new facts on day one, but yesterday we also learned that ATF apparently misled the Department of Defense, essentially lied to establish the defense, the necessary drug connection, entitling them to get special forces training by the nation's crack drug interdiction unit, JTF-6. In addition, the money for the Waco military training and equipment came uh, and it was conceded the administration's Assistant Secretary of Defense, Ambassador Holmes, out of money spotted for fighting the nation's drug war. On top of this, further and increasingly fla fatal flaws were revealed in the so-called Treasury Review Report. Treasury documents strongly suggest, and at other points witnesses testified, that there are apparent cases of obstruction of justice littered throughout the review process. The ATF also got training that was for, quote, indiscriminate firing or mute, not the more discriminate close quarters training. DOD trainers were not convinced that the ATF believed in their own uh, methamphetamine lab. That's all in one day, and all new facts. There are other new facts and documents and testimony, but these are a start at really understanding the truth. And in my view, the American people expect tough and thoughtful oversight, and that is what we are here. We will find the facts. We will seek the truth. And I just would like to just mention one of the things that you see in this morning's paper, and, and I just quote from the Washington Post, and, and it's reference to, to the president. And he said, in quote, people in elected office, unquote, who portrayed federal law enforcers as some sort of armed bureaucracy acting on private grudges and hidden agendas ought to be ashamed of themselves, unquote. Uh, I, for this member of Congress, I'll let everybody else speak for themselves, have totally committed to the process of finding out the truth. I make no apologies for finding out the truth, and I hope everybody else is committed along with the rest of us. Uh, and I thank you very much, and I yield to the uh, gentleman from Florida, Mr. Bill McCollum, co-chair of this, these subcommittees. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zella, for yielding to me this morning. I think that if we're looking at this from the perspective of where we've gone and where we're going to go, we need to have a little overview this morning. We've been through a couple of days of hearings now. Uh, most of the testimony we've had in these two days have been to give us a prelude to the raid that occurred on February 28, 1993, uh, during which time four ATF officers were killed and six uh, of those who were in the compound, six other Americans were. We will begin next week, uh, in the middle of the week, a question about the final uh, assault that was a, a question mark as well, dealing with the FBI and the Justice Department involvement. What we've learned to this point in time, at least it seems to me, is that we had a very confused set of circumstances. We did not have a written plan for the raid that occurred on February 28th. The two primary, uh, or three primary planners who testified last night stated a number of, of points that were interesting. and and had some serious disputes with the Treasury report with regard to about, I think, 10, 15, or 20 percent of the accuracy of that report, they said. Uh, during the process of this, we've learned that uh, the principals involved at the uh, ATF who did the raid and directed it were dismissed. But uh, two of them here last night have been reinstated, uh, reinstated as a part of their effort to try to go uh, back uh, and get their jobs back again. So while uh, the Treasury report says they lied about certain key elements, one has to wonder why were they reinstated under those circumstances, uh, and they say they did not. So we began to listen to some very interesting facts. They say the report's not accurate, Treasury says this, so on and so forth. We're going to get to hear today uh, from those who were at Treasury at the time that this raid was planned uh, and executed to find out just what role the Treasury Department had uh, and what oversight it had in the process of the pre-planning and the execution of the raid. Uh, we heard some experts yesterday say that they didn't believe that the 
question of dynamic entry was such a good idea. A couple said uh, maybe it was, but we heard very much uh, evidence from one who had been the original crisis management program person at the FBI, who was 23 years with that agency, uh, say that he thought the, that David Koresh, the head of this particular religious group in Waco, should have been captured outside and that patients should have been had. Uh, we had he and a former head of the law enforcement part of or the enforcement part of ATF uh, years gone by tell us that they thought that a siege was a better idea. It looks to me as though Mr. Buford, who was involved in the planning of this raid, uh, had relied heavily on his bad experience at an earlier raid in Arkansas to discount the idea of an extended or protracted siege. Uh, there were apparent opportunities for Koresh to be captured outside. Uh, they did not wait around. Uh, they wanted to go ahead and pursue and get their search warrant executed. And so there was a lot of haste involved. Uh, I think we're seeing evidence that the actual planning of this, uh, having never been committed to writing, uh, was done as a dynamic entry uh, without all of the intelligence that should have been there. Uh, we know that that wasn't all gathered. We had testimony last night uh, to the effect that photographs taken at the Outlook House where they were trying to see what was going on in the compound uh, went undeveloped and that one of those photographs actually would have displayed and shown that we had a very a woman standing up there on guard with apparently a semi-automatic or automatic rifle. Uh, there were videos, and that should have alerted them to a little more danger maybe than they were expecting. There were videos that were taken there that apparently were never reviewed by the planning officers uh, before they made the raid. Uh, we are going to hear uh, down the road on Monday, I guess, uh, about what the intelligence uh, fellow who went inside had to say. But the bottom line of all of this is that we have a situation where some folks died on this date of February 28th. Uh, we have some evidence that's come out in the last couple of days that shows there was no particularly danger to the community by waiting around and trying to capture Koresh instead. Uh, we have some real dispute over the judgment that was used in this. But in the bottom line, we're moving progressively through the way this happened and why it happened and ultimately trying to assess who was responsible for the mistakes that were made, and indeed we've heard mistakes that were made, even, even mistakes that the officers said yesterday that they made and wish they could have corrected. But I resent the suggestion by anybody that this side of the aisle has played politics or is playing politics with this, that we do not care about law enforcement or the ATF officers. We do. We care about them, their families, the loss of life that are involved. We are not playing politics. We're trying to answer the basic questions of who, what, where, why, when, and how, and get some accountability into this process. It does take thorough examination. Not every fact brought out of here is going to be new. It doesn't have to be new because the American public's only gotten snippets off of uh, one television program or another about this and have never, I would suggest most people, never picked up and read reports like the Treasury Report and certainly haven't had it challenged as is being challenged in part uh, in these hearing process. We need to go through this and efforts to distract us or direct our attention elsewhere, or inflammatory statements notwithstanding, our job is to get through the process. We're going to go through that. We're looking forward today to talking to Treasury and others about their involvement, and we're looking forward uh, as we move into the next stage of finding out what actually happened on the day of the raid and then the wrap-up preview of it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. McCollum. The chair now recognizes the ranking minority member of the Oversight Committee's National Security and Criminal Justice Subcommittee, our good friend Karen Thurman from Florida. Thank you and good morning. First, um, Chairman Zeliff, let me first thank you for clarifying a misstatement made during yesterday's hearings about missing Treasury personnel records. The Department of Treasury did provide those documents, uh, Mr. Micah, just so you'll know. I think you had left the hearing um, prior to that coming back, but you in fact do have those. And I appreciate the fact that you made a point of inserting well, those and clarifying those. Uh, no, not at this moment. Let me finish my opening statement. Last night, we also heard about the preparation for the raid and the raid itself from some of the, those most responsible for its planning. I listened with great sadness as William Buford recalled being wounded repeatedly and watching his friends and fellow officers dying around him from gunshot wounds. Despite wearing helmets and bulletproof vests, the firepower, firepower these agents faced was fierce and unrelenting. This morning's testimony will get to the heart of what went wrong with the ATF raid on February 28, 1993. 
This is the tragic day when four law enforcement officers and six Branch Davidians lost their lives before a ceasefire could be negotiated. I hope that today's proceedings will shed more light on that disastrous day. I repeat my earlier statements that my mission in these hearings is to find the answers that will ensure, another, ensure that another Waco will never happen again. Another important witness we will hear from today is Dr. Joyce Sparks of the Texas Department of Protective and Regulatory Services. Dr. Sparks interviewed Carrie Jewell six days before the ATF raid in 1993 and concluded that Carrie was quite credible, as everyone I believe on this panel now knows. Dr. Sparks will provide compelling testimony about child abuse taking place inside the compound, as did Dr. Bruce Perry testify in our first day. I must say that I disagree with some members who now contend that the issue of child abuse is irrelevant to this hearing process. The issue has been repeatedly raised by the majority, specifically in criticizing the ATF search warrant and by decision to subpoena two authors whose conclusion was generally that David Koresh was a preacher with some unusual beliefs but no threat to anyone. I believe we have proven beyond any doubt that David Koresh was molesting young girls and talked about mass suicide. The fact is that we must look at every aspect of what happened at Waco. Carrie Jewell's brave testimony, however disturbing to all of us, both as parents and members of Congress, adds to our understanding of these events. This tragedy, after all, is about the loss of human life. We should never forget that. And at this time, I'd like to um, give the balance of my time to Curtis Collins, the ranking member. I thank you for the chairwoman. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today. It may be Friday for most people, but in this room, we have a lot of Monday morning quarterbacks. This is a continuation of yesterday's hearing on the decisions leading up to the Waco raid. With four agents losing their lives and many wounded, it's not surprising that the raid has been severely criticized by many of my colleagues. It has also been criticized by the agency itself. What I find interesting are some of the alternatives proposed by my Republican colleagues. Several colleagues suggested that Special Agent Aguilera should have accepted David Koresh's invitation to come on over and inspect the weapons. Now I wonder how many of these Monday morning quarterbacks would have done that. William Buford, who was shot numerous times during the Waco raid, including several, including suffering numerous wounds inflicted after he had been disabled, said there was no way he would have allowed the agents to go to the compound with David Koresh's known arsenal of weapons. If Agent Aguilera had been ambushed, I could just imagine the congressional hearings looking into how a supervisor could send his agent into Mount Carmel without an armed force knowing about all of David Koresh's machine guns. The Monday morning quarterbacks also chose to or choose to ignore congressional action. Yesterday, much, action, much attention was paid to whether ATF made up a drug allegation in order to get military assistance and whether the rules of uh, posse comitatus were broken. Unfortunately, no attention was paid to the numerous congressional mandates that the military should get involved in domestic law enforcement, particularly in the war on drugs. Now, I have consistently opposed the use of military and law enforcement. In 1986, I opposed an amendment to require the military to give assistance in enforcing the drug laws. The amendment passed 359 to 52 with two Republican dissenters. There was a third Republican dissenter that day, President Reagan, but he was ignored by his party. All along as we write loopholes, agencies will find a way to use them. The Monday morning quarterbacks also ignore the taint of these hearings caused by the committee's relationship with the National Rifle Association. Despite repeated calls to investigate the role of the NRA in these hearings, particularly in light of their calls of a, to a witness alleging that they were putting together the hearings, Republicans refuse to investigate. Republicans want to review every phone call and every scribble that involved President Clinton and his counsel, despite the absence of a shred of evidence that his involvement extended to anything but keeping fully informed. Yet when we ask questions about the committee's relationship with the NRA, we are told that all communications are privileged, they're sensitive, they're attorney-client privileged. So welcome to day three of eight days of Mondays with a room full of Monday morning quarterbacks. Thank you for yielding. Thank you very much. I now recognize Mr. Schumer from New York. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I guess the theme of my opening statement is nothing new, nothing new, nothing new. To quote today's New York Times, quote, no significant new evidence was cited. Now, these hearings, I think, have been billed as looking at the, a new way to look at the Waco tragedy. I think if they were billed as they are now being by some, well, 
No new facts will come out, but for the first time, the American people will see on C-SPAN what happened at Waco. Even though it's all been included in books and other things, then we'd be doing hearings on everything under the sun, and that's the only thing we would do. I also think it was significant yesterday that the case was made conclusively, again to quote the New York Times, that none on the uh, minority, majority side offered, that the majority side, quote, offered no proof that the posse comitatus law was violated. And in fact, everybody on the witness table said that there was no doubt the posse comitatus law, comitatus law was not violated, despite all the talk before the hearings that there might be serious breaches or this, that, or the other thing. It seems to me, Mr. Chairman, that evidence that's purporting to be new coming from, and I'm not saying members of this committee, but coming from this cottage industry of those on the extreme right has been repeatedly discredited and would not pass the laugh test in a real court of law. The majority case would raise serious questions of competence of counsel in a genuine trial. Let me give you some examples. Witnesses like Robert Sanders, a former ATF official who had nothing, had no evidence, no firsthand evidence of what happened at Waco. He was called here, and he makes his living by feeding on cases referred to by the NRA, and who admitted yesterday he meets regularly with NRA leader Tanya Mataska. Why was he here? Why? How about evidence like the Larry Sparks memorandum? wasn't just mentioned, it was repeatedly ragged on by members of the other side. Well, Larry Sparks was fired for sexual harassment, and he bragged that he would do anything, that's his quote, do anything to get the ATF in revenge. If this were simply an even-handed hearing to get the facts, maybe the Sparks memorandum would have been mentioned, but it hardly would have been a major subject of discussion when 61 people on the other are on the other side saying what Sparks said is all wet. And finally, redundant, repetitious questioning of witnesses, like the Special Forces soldiers who were here yesterday, fine, brave men, who were forced to repeat over and over and over again their statements that they had stayed strictly within the law, even though the majority side had no, no proof of any wrongdoing. Now, today's first panel, again, seems to me, underscores the nature of this show trial. Decent men and women like Secretary Benson and his staff are being dragged up here to go over matters already, already thoroughly investigated and documented. No one has alleged, there's not even a scintilla of evidence that Secretary Benson even knew what was going on here. He was busy on other matters. And yet here he is, coming up here to be asked again the same thing that he was asked time and time and time again that is written and that is documented. And let's recall witness Buford, the brave ATF man who led the raid, lost three in the ambush. And here's what he said yesterday, very poignantly, something everyone on this panel should be aware of. He said, he felt like he did when he was, his coming here, he felt like he did when he came home from Vietnam, vilified for doing his duty. So, that's what I think we have. To me, what sums up this proceeding maybe better than anything else was the testimony, as I mentioned, of Robert Sanders, the disgruntled ATF employee who had no direct knowledge of events at Waco, but did have direct contact with the National Rifle Association. Today we'll hear from Joyce Sparks, who was misled by the NRA into believing they worked for the committee. Once again, we see the long arm of the NRA in this hearing. In conclusion, Mr. Chairman, the administration has given the majority every document they've asked for, no matter how trivial and irrelevant they may be to Waco. Yet our one request, that we get to the bottom of the role of the NRA in this hearing, has been denied again and again. If the other side has nothing to hide, they have nothing to fear. Thank the gentleman. Thank you, Mr. Schumer. Um, I just would like to make a point that no one was dragged here this morning. Um, everybody appears voluntarily. No one is a subpoenaed to appear. Uh, 
We thank you all for coming up. If you, the first panel would uh, join us at the witness table. Yes, sir. Can I make a few comments to begin this? Oh, uh, I would be delighted to have you make a few comments. I, I thought you would. <laughs> My good friend from Michigan. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I once again commend you for your excellent job as chairman. Uh, it's, uh, it's interesting, ladies and gentlemen, that the... Uh, uh, just please be seated for just a moment. You, you can stand later to take the oath. It's interesting that uh, there are claims on the other side, my friends, the Republicans, that there are many, many new facts coming forward. And I was particularly interested in the claim that they wanted to remake about their concern for law enforcement. It's very important they do that because... I, I thought you'd just say a minute or so. Could you just kind of... Do a, do a minute, otherwise the fellows on the other side are going to want their equal time, and I, I really would like to move forward. Oh, you, 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 they were waiving their time in, on the basis that I waived mine. We, we were just going to do two, we were going to do unanimous consensus I four of us, but well, I want to give you time. No, you're, you're still a good chairman, so good Thank that you. I'm going to uh, relinquish my time. I can put my statement you in You are record. an absolute great American. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are wonderful. Thank you. Um, as a point of personal privilege, I would like to yield the chair to Jackson Lee from Houston, Texas, for purposes of introduction of uh, Secretary Benson. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, and that uh, adds again to your uh, excellence as a chair presiding today. It takes um, a special uh, a privilege to be able to introduce both a great Texan as well as a great American. And this does not in any way taint my commitment to finding out the truth of these proceedings. But I think we'd be less than honest if we did not acknowledge uh, former Secretary Lloyd Benson uh, for the years of service as secretary, but more importantly as a senior senator more than two decades uh, in the great state of Texas. And his great leadership in the United States Senate, uh, chairing the Senate Finance Committee, but personally knowing his great commitment to civil rights and civil justice. And I am, for one, very proud of the service that he has given to this nation, uh, particularly the service that he has given uh, to the state of Texas. And Senator Benson, let me add, as a Texan from Houston, Texas, uh, which I can proudly say that you so ably and warmly claim as your home, along with many of your family members, uh, that we are proud of the service that you've given. Uh, we appreciate your presence here. And we're more than delighted to have you contribute to the process of which American people have come to believe in this nation. That is truth and facts uh, and justice. And so I applaud you for your service. And Mr. Chairman, I thank you for allowing me this privilege. Again, Senator Benson, Secretary Benson, welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to also say that that uh, echoes the comments that I made, you, made to you personally when I first came into the room this morning. So thank you for being here. I'd like to introduce all the witnesses. Um, Mr. Steve Higgins, it's to my left, your right. Uh, former director of the ATF, um, John Simpson, former, former acting assistant secretary of treasury, uh, Christopher Kyler, did I pronounce that right? Uh, ATF liaison for assistant secretary, um, Michael Langan, former acting deputy assistant secretary of treasury, uh, and Lloyd Benson, former secretary of the treasury. If you would, uh, it's a customary practice of this, uh, these subcommittees to Parliamentary procedure. Please state your parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, when I chaired a previous subcommittee of this uh, committee, when uh, Secretary Kemp appeared before us as a witness, although I swore in every other witness as a matter of collegial courtesy, I did not ask Secretary Kemp to be sworn in. I do not believe it is appropriate to ask Secretary Benson to be sworn in. Well, uh, my, my, and forgive me, I just, uh, I, I don't believe he has any concerns of it. I'll let him stay. I am sure him. he has no concerns, uh, but, but I but think But he is a member of the private sector now, and I don't, I don't know whether we should treat him any differently. Secretary Benson, do you have any problems with being sworn in? I, I have no problem at all. Thank I, you. I appreciate, well, please, yeah. I appreciate the congressman, and I appreciate the congresswoman and her comments. Yes. 
In the testimony you're about to give these subcommittees, do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record show that the answer was in the affirmative. Okay, the chair recognizes Mr. Micah for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm going to yield to you in just a second, but before I yield, I do want to say that uh, I think you and uh, Mr. McCollum have accurately focused the purpose of these hearings, and the purpose of the hearings is to see why four ATF agents died in a botched uh, raid at uh, uh, headed by a federal agency, and at very least, why uh, at least 50 women and children were incinerated by the uh, actions of the federal government, and that's the reason uh, that we're here. And furthermore, Mr. Chairman, I intend to pursue my request uh, to also uh, subpoena uh, individuals who are now advising the White House, including Mr. Podesta, uh, who is a formerly represented hand, handgun control uh, and is now advising this administration on how to try to make a circus of uh, these proceedings. But uh, uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I appreciate your yielding to me and I'll yield the balance of my time I, to you. I thank you for yielding. Um, I'd like the clerk to hand out the Roger Altman letter. Mr. Benson, this, this letter is addressed to you, Mr. Secretary, and I'm sorry that Mr. Altman could not be here today. He made himself available to the subcommittees yesterday's, but yesterday, but we're a little off schedule uh, because of the change to the five-minute rule, and he's offered to make himself available next week. It seems that Mr. Altman was very wise in his perspective, and I would like you to comment on whether you saw the letter and did you take any action based on Mr. Altman's perspective. Let, uh, what I'd like to do, I, I think probably the easiest way to do this, is let me read this letter. Yes, sir. Copies of that letter? None of us have seen that. Okay. Before um, you... All right, we'll be happy to pass our copies. You know, we have a standing agreement that we're going to make all of these documents available, both one side, each to the other. So maybe you could hold up and we could get a copy of this letter. We don't have this. Yeah. Right. Okay. There was an agreement among council. Just thank you. Can we make some copies for our side, please? Thank you. Okay. Okay. I appreciate it. We all set? Okay. I'm going to, uh, we're going to adjust the timer on this. Um, uh, this letter is from Roger Altman, uh, memorandum for Secretary Benson. Subject is Waco. Ron Noble informed me that the Atten Attorney General is weighing a request from the FBI to use an advanced form of tear gas on the compound in Waco. And I will also say this is dated April 15, 1993. Among other things, this gas doesn't dissipate. The FBI apparently has concluded that the outlook for a negotiated end to the standoff is poor. They don't believe it is worth waiting. If the Attorney General approves the request, the gas would be used and hopefully the Davidians would be forced to leave the compound. The gas would not be followed by an assault. This is the Attorney General's decision. You said on Meet the Press that nothing like this would occur without your knowledge. As I understand it, you will be formally notified if Janet Reno okays it. My rough guess is that she won't. The risks of a tragedy are there. And if the FBI waits indefinitely, Mr. Koresh eventually will concede. Now this is too uh, you, Mr. Benson, is from Roger Altman. Its subject is Waco, and the date is April 15, 1993. And I guess the, the, the question is, is that did you receive this, this letter? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I think, I, yes, I received the letter. The decision, of course, was the Attorney General's decision. But being, being a person in that very responsible position, how in God's name, I mean, could you not have just called it off? Why wouldn't you have? The decision belonged to the Attorney General, not to me. Wouldn't this be something that you would call the President and 
And isn't, isn't this a crisis before it happened that you could have influenced the, the result? I'm sure all of these things were weighed by the Attorney General. So no that matter what the Attorney General was going to do, who basically reported to you, it was okay? I get right back to the question of who has authority, who has jurisdiction, and the jurisdiction belonged to the Attorney General. The decision was to be made there with the investigation of all the facts. Did you tell the President? Did you give this letter to the President? I don't recall that. Did you weigh in? Did you call the President? Mr. Secretary, Secretary Benson, speak a little louder, please. You pull your mic a little bit forward. Once again, I had my responsibilities and my duties, and those I was complying with. This, at this point, had become the responsibility of the Attorney General. I would like to say, Mr. Chairman, at some point here, I've been called back. I have been in charge of my own time and my own responsibilities up until the last two days. Uh, I would like to have, at some point, the opportunity to tell what we did at Treasury and what I set about in seeking the truth that you're talking about. With this commission, they did an exhaustive study right. that was commended time and time again by the media for the detail of that report as we sought the truth right. and then well, what, we what we'd like to do is we'll about give you, to correct those matters. We'll, we'll give you that opportunity and over the next two and a half hours or three hours uh, you'll have that opportunity. Uh, question I have is did you do anything as a result of this or did it just go in a wastebasket? I mean, uh, you, did you call the president? Did you alert anybody? Did you talk to Hubble? Did you talk to anybody at all? Let me say I took care of my responsibilities and my jurisdiction, and this was the jurisdiction at this point of the Attorney General, and I'm sure that she had fully isn't, studied it before making her decision. Isn't this an alarm that's crying out for some responsible action? If, if you see this, I mean, didn't Roger Altman sound the alarm, and did any, was anybody listening? Let me state that I am sure that this went, was gone into extensively and intensively in the Attorney General's office. Did you personally do anything as a result of getting this alarm, cry for help? Let me say I did an extensive study as to what had happened After the and fact. corrections that had to be taken. But what about the time that you received this on the 15th of April, four days before the process? My, my time's run out, but... But your can time, you just, our, our policy here... I have been answered your answer question, question. And so far as the responsibilities I had to take care of, and I did just that. And this jurisdiction at this point had been transferred to the Attorney General. Okay, so nothing was done. Chairman. My time has expired. Mrs. Thurman. At this time, I would yield my time to the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Taylor. Thank you, Mr. Thurman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by complimenting our chairman and their zest for all of the facts. They both said in the media and on television, they want to know all the facts. What troubles me is that as the members of this committee start looking into what happened, we find more and more important that we need to know what happened in the events leading up to the raid. Why was there a raid? And yet, when you look at the witness list, it is notoriously slim on those events leading up to the raid. Last night, sitting in that chair is an ex-Green Beret ATF agent who got shot up. And I asked him, and I'm, not, I'm going to paraphrase my words, in fairness to the agents who died, don't you think we ought to subpoena the people who wrote this article called The Sinful Messiah and published an editorial on the day before the raid calling for law enforcement to do something. Don't you think, in fairness to those four dead people and the 20 agents who got shot up, they would at least have Mark England and Darlene McCormick, who wrote the article and then left town for fear for their lives, who worked for a paper that changed the locks, took the identification off their vehicles, published the articles on a weekend, because then, then they would have a chance to judge the reaction of the Davidians, a people they knew to be violent, before they went back and started bringing their employees in on Monday. They were taking precautions themselves because they knew what type of people we were dealing with. Don't you think we ought to know about the lady who claims to have been held captive there for three months? 
And don't you think we ought to know about another lady who says Koresh compiled a hit list to murder ex-Davidians who were talking to the press and who were talking to law enforcement? I've made a very simple request of our chairman. I'd like those four people to be given the same opportunity to testify as everyone else. They denied that. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm now going to take this opportunity to request that this committee subpoena those people because you cannot operate in the vacuum starting with the day of the raid. You have to know why there was a raid. And this will help this committee know why there was a raid. Just one little girl sitting there helped to make the citizens aware. But that one little girl is enough. There was a heck of a lot of other wrong going on inside that camp, that compound. And there were a heck of a lot of dangerous people in that compound who turned around and, and by the admission of an ex-Green Beret, outgunned his people like no ambush he had ever seen in Vietnam. I therefore make the motion, Mr. Chairman, that we subpoena the four people listed in the letter that I very politely asked you and the other chairman to just request that they be here. I call for a vote, Mr. Chairman. Okay, you were not recognized for that purpose. You were given five minutes under the five minute rule. Is there anything additional? Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, is this a cover up? Don't you want the American people to know we have, all of the facts? We have 100 witnesses. Mr. We Chairman, have starting with the day of the ample raid. Opportunity for the the minority, ample the raid. opportunity for the minority to supply their request for witnesses. And We've we did. We've accommodated in every way we possibly can. You, re you received the letter from the minority asking that these people be subpoenaed. You denied it. You denied it, and Mr. McCollum denied it, and I think the members of this committee should make that decision. Are the members of this committee afraid to make that decision? Mr. Chairman, regular order. We are in regular order. He's under his five minutes. I'm under my five minutes. Every right so are the members of this committee afraid to have those people testify? Are you afraid to let the world know that the ATF agents were outgunned, that there were dangerous people in there, that they had converted weapons to fully automatic, which incidentally is against the law? that children were being molested, and that the reporters who brought this to the attention of the world feared for their lives. Are you afraid for the American public to know that? I think you we, said you wanted we, the truth. I'm asking that they be subpoenaed. I'm asking for a vote on it, Mr. Chairman. We uh, put that material in the record uh, the other day, I believe at your suggestion. Uh, we had no problems with that. Mr. We Chairman, considered your request. Uh, we took it to the leadership, as you suggested. Uh, they supported our decision at this point to not uh, have first the NRA people under subpoena and now these people under subpoena. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the rules of the House of Representatives allow a committee to by majority vote. Order and I call for... The gentleman's request is not in order. The time has expired. I disagree, Mr. Chairman. The rules of the House of Representatives... ...the chair and I demand a vote on the ruling of the chair. And I would remind you that the rules of the House of Representatives do allow the majority of a committee to subpoena a witness. Okay. Be happy to have a vote. I mean subpoena, yes sir, because they're afraid for their life, Henry. So would you, would you state your, your motion at this point? Yes sir. Okay. Are you talking to me, sir? Okay, Mr. Lantos. Yes. You're appealing the ruling of the chair. That is correct. No. Mr. Lantos. Yes, you have to still appeal the ruling of the chair. My motion is in order. inquiry, Mr. Chairman. I have a parliamentary inquiry. State, state nature My of your parliamentary, parliamentary inquiry is, it, is it in order at this point in time for Mr. Taylor to make a request that certain individuals be subpoenaed? He's not recognized for that purpose. When will he okay. recognized for He's recognized for five so minutes to talk to the witnesses. Is that the ruling of the parliamentarian? Parliamentary that's, inquiry. That's really the when, wait, can I continue my parliamentary inquiry? When is such a motion in order? So we ask the parliamentarian, who has been a very fair bipartisan part. In fact, he was our parliamentarian before we lost. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you really put him under pressure. <laughs> and he may be again. This, this, sense of fair, this sense of fairness is going to be a killer. I can see that. <laughs> Thank you.
be the order. Okay, it, it was an order under regular committee business. We are now operating under the five minute rule. So, that so, is your fair, impartial okay. answer. So just okay. continuing inquiry. my parliamentary inquiry, so that would mean at the start of business on Monday, such a motion would be in order. Is that correct? And the chair, is that, uh, that's what I assume the gentleman is uh, saying, the chair is saying. This, this is a hearing, this is not a committee meeting in order to transact committee business, this is a hearing. So does that mean such a motion, are you, are you saying, can I, can I please, does that mean that such a motion is never in order during this hearing? It, it says basically that is out of order. During the whole hearing, we cannot make a request to subpoena anybody. Is that correct? Is that what you're saying? Okay. Then I think the gentleman has appealed the ruling of the chair, or the gentleman from California has appe appealed of the ruling of the chair, okay. and I demand a vote on my appeal. Chairman, I move that that lie, I move the gentleman's appeal lie on the table. Okay. The question occurs on the motion. The clerk will call the roll. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as instruction, do I call the subcommittees? Mr. Chairman, fine. I'll be clerk. Uh, Mr. McNulty will call the roll for each call, subcommittee. Call, call, two subcommittees. Call, call each subcommittee separately. Parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman. Parliamentary uh, inquiry is not in order at this stage. It's clerk a motion to roll. I request a clarification, Mr. Chairman. Are we voting on my motion or on Mr. Hyde's motion? Uh, Mr. Hyde's motion to table. Mr. McNulty, please call the roll. Mr. McCollum. Aye. Mr. Schiff. Ms. Ross Lettinen. Aye. Mr. Coble. Mr. Booyer. Aye. Mr. Shattig. Aye. Mr. Shabbat. Mr. Blute. Aye. Mr. Micah. Aye. Mr. Barr. Aye. Mr. Heineman. Mr. Mr. Ehrlich. Mr. Ehrlich. Mr. Bryant. Mr. Souter. Ms. Thurman. Mr. Schumer? No. Mr. Scott? No. Ms. Lantos? No. Mr. Lantos? Mr. Watt? No. Mr. Wise? No. Ms. Jackson Lee? No. Mr. Condon? No. Ms. Lofgren? No. Ms. Slaughter? No. Mr. Taylor? No. Mr. Brewster? No. Mr. Zellup? Aye. Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Ms. Collins? How is Ms. Collins recorded? Uh, Ms. Collins is not recorded. I vote no. Mr. Chairman, just the point of inquiry. What we're doing is we're we doing one subcommittee and then you're. How would both fold? She's an official member. Oh, of that okay. Okay. Next to the rules of their committee. Okay. Ex officio, we'll vote. Yep. Go ahead. Mr. Um, Mr. Klinger. Uh, aye. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Is this gentleman a member of this committee? Yeah. Ex officio. Yeah. 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 Just as much as Mrs. Collins is. I mean, I we're both. Uh, you have a problem with that? Who's you have to come to more meetings. <laughs> Don't want to deprive the gentleman of a vote if he's entitled to one. Pa parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Speaker. You just said this wasn't a committee meeting, so how can it be a... a we're taking the role. We're, we're taking a vote. There are rules and, and for the committees. Mr. Mr. Hyde. Mr. Conyers. And Ms. Collins. Vote no, Ms. Collins. Yep. Ms. Collins, is that a no? A very strong no. Two no's. Hey, man, One no. the rules are changing. 
I would hardly think you're going to find a precedent in this one. Jefferson's okay. manual. Clerk will report. Mr. Chairman, on that motion, the ayes are 17, the noes are 14. Okay. Majority of both subcommittees have agreed to make the table. Regular order, Mr. Chairman. Okay, the parliamentary inquiry will be heard. Mr. Chairman, um, on the record yesterday, I requested consideration of subpoenaing Larry Sparks. I would hope that by way of that being in the hearing record, uh, that uh, the vote today does not impact previous requests on subpoenas. It was uh, in the record, I made the request, and the chairman presiding at that, in, at that time indicated that I would receive consideration. Okay. The record speaks for itself. The committee will proceed. Mr. Chairman, parliamentary inquiry. Uh, yesterday, I requested uh, subpoena of uh, certain advisors to the White House and the uh, Clinton administration and also people within the administration. Uh, and uh, no action has been taken on that. When would it be appropriate uh, for me to... Uh, that, that is not a parliamentary inquiry. The thank subcommittee you, will thank now you, proceed. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Question. He didn't even start. Okay. Uh, the chair now yields to the Honorable Mr. Klinger from Pennsylvania. I'll yield to Mr. McCullum in a moment, but I just want to point out for the record that the individuals who the gentleman from Mississippi seeks to subpoena uh, for these hearings are the defendants in a lawsuit brought by the widows of uh, the ATF agents who died. That, I think, puts us into a very, very sensitive area, as we've learned in the past, where witnesses have been called before congressional subcommittees testimony has been uh, used or has poisoned the well in terms of the civil suit or that was uh, ongoing. So I think it would be, a, in addition to the fact that I think it's not part of these hearings, I think the fact is that this would be uh, very, very delicate and, per and perhaps could uh, jeopardize the uh, lawsuits ongoing. And at this point, I would yield now to the gentleman from uh, Florida, Mr. McCullum. Parliamentary inquiry, Not, pro not appropriate. Uh, I believe, Mr. Chairman, I have the time. Yes, you do. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hold, hold that until after he's finished with his time. Secretary, uh, Mr. Secretary uh, Benson, I'd like to follow up with a question of clarification. I didn't anticipate particularly the line of questioning you received at the beginning of this, but we've gotten off the track, and I think we need to clarify this. After you received this letter that was handed to you dated April 15, 1993, uh, from Roger Altman, or memorandum, I think is better how it's described, about the potential use of gas at the compound in Waco and advising you that he expected uh, you will be formally notified if Janet Reno okays it. Uh, at any time between the time you learned of its use and the time that this memorandum was sent, did you have a conversation about the gas with uh, Attorney General Reno? Uh, Congressman, I don't recall that. You don't recall having will, such a conversation? I will tell you at that point, of course, uh, that this was all under the jurisdiction and the raid, of course, uh, under the FBI. No, and I understand under that, the Mr. Attorney Secretary. General. I understand that. Yeah. You, do, you do not recall a conversation with Attorney no, General. I do, not. do you recall that at any time you discussed with the president the use of this gas before it was no, used? No, I do not. Um, Mr. Secretary, at what time? And let's go back away from the gas question. Let's go back over to the question of the raid, which is on February 28th, which was under. ATF supervision, which was under your jurisdiction, at least at Treasury at that time. That's correct. When did you first learn of the raid or any plan for that raid? The first, uh, I was in uh, London uh, at my first meeting with the G7, with the ministers of finance, and was very much involved in that one. I came back, uh, is the best I can recall, sometime uh, early Sunday morning on a night flight from London. Uh, and in turn, uh, I did not find out about the raid, to the best of my memory, until uh, early Sunday evening. And that's the first knowledge I had of it at all. In other words, there was no discussion with you, no information passed to you prior to the time of the raid that it was anticipated or that it might exist or any nature at all. So you had no inkling it was going to occur None. whatsoever. 
Uh, isn't it a little bit surprising that the largest or one of the largest raids in the BATF's history uh, was taking place and the Secretary of the Treasury, the chief of all of the law enforcement of the ATF, was not notified? Well, I can well understand when I was abroad attending uh, an international meeting and involved in uh, uh, the questions of monetary uh, exchange rates and some very serious subjects uh, at that point that others within the department uh, were handling the situation. But didn't you keep in contact with your office during the time you were over there? Weren't there regular telephone well, of course, calls, communications, etc.? Of course we had contact with the office. But nobody from the law enforcement division thought that you ought to be disturbed about this particular incident, I guess, and asked about it. Uh, I understand. Let me go, move on very briefly and ask a, a question uh, to Mr. Kuehler, if I could in this case. There is a, uh, an indication that at one point you prepared a memorandum uh, that was sent to Mr. Langan, I believe, uh, describing the anticipated raid. What, uh, am I correct in that, and what precipitated the preparation of that memorandum? And uh, did you deliver it? And uh, to your knowledge, uh, what happened after you did that, if you did? Yes, sir, I prepared that memorandum and delivered it to Mr. Langan. This was uh, ATF's advisory to Treasury that we were going to conduct a raid. Uh, after it was given to Mr. Langan, we spoke to several other officials at Treasury and provided them with a copy of it to advise them what we were going to do on Sunday. Did you advise there was a potential for casualties at that raid uh, on Sunday? This, what, let me ask this question first. What was the date that that was delivered? What was the date of that memorandum? On February 26th. Two days before. Had Correct. there, to your knowledge, been any information passed to the Treasury officials overseeing ATF about the potential for this raid prior to that date? Not to my knowledge. Thank you. I think my time has expired, and I will. I know there was a lot of discussion at the beginning of it. That may be disputable, but I see a red light, so I will yield. Please state your uh, parliamentary inquiry. Uh, just before Mr. McCollum spoke, uh, Mr. Klinger indicated that the reporters, uh, that uh, the gentleman from Mississippi wished to call, uh, couldn't be called because they were defendants in a lawsuit. Now, I recall yesterday the uh, agents uh, who were called uh, testified that they were also defendants in a lawsuit, including Mr. Uh, Buford, who was shot in the, um, in the event. And the inquiry is, uh, is it this committee's policy that those uh, witnesses who have been sued will be excused from testifying? Gentlelady Yield. Gentlelady Yield, I think she makes an excellent point. If there's anyone who's enmeshed in lawsuits, it's Mr. Boynotsky and Mr. Sarabin, who were called yesterday and are called, going to be called next week. Uh, I yield back. I don't think you can yield on... No, 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 no. I asked her to yield to augment her parliamentary inquiry. She couldn't have yielded to you in the first place, but go ahead. I retract The inquiry word. is, uh, based on Mr. Klinger's statement, that those who have, are defendants in lawsuits uh, shouldn't be called. Will we excuse uh, other witnesses who are defendants in lawsuits uh, stemming from the events in Waco? since we are apparently excusing the reporters on that General, basis. General Lady did not state a parliamentary inquiry. Uh, it may be a, a, a thought to consider and a possible controlling factor, but um, we, we uh, at this point, uh, we're going to go to regular order. Recognize Mrs. Thurman from Florida for five minutes. No, she had her five minutes. Okay. Okay. okay, Mr. Schumer. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first, again, I want to thank uh, the attorney, uh, the former Secretary of the Treasury, from being brought up here. I thought the first line of questioning by my colleague from New Hampshire was way out of line. Although I think Mr. McCollum's questions were on the money in terms of legitimate questions to ask. I don't think it showed anything. Because let's just clarify: when the the, the memo that Roger Altman wrote was after ATF was out of the picture and Treasury was out of the picture completely. In fact, isn't it true that was, there was special effort because of the ATF problems in the first raid that, they, that Treasury and ATF were totally insulated and removed from any planning and anything that had to do with the second raid? Is that correct, sir? Uh, that's correct, Congressman. So was there was totally, an effort not totally to Totally under inform. the control at that point of the FBI uh, and the Department of Justice. Correct. There were two raids, as everyone knows. The first was ATF. Mr. McCollum asked the secretary, 
Why didn't he know about it? I think that's a legitimate question. He was away, and obviously the secretary doesn't know about all the things. But the second one, he had no knowledge. And let me ask you this. Did Roger Altman have any role or any expertise in making any kind of judgment about this? Did he get, was he involved the second raid? Was he no, involved no. in any of the planning? Uh, not to my knowledge no. at all. I would guess not. Totally I think they from wanted that. him miles away. So his comments here would be the comments of any layman. In other words, someone yes. with no special knowledge at all. That's correct. And he is not here, but if he were here, and I think, I must say, I think to you, Mr. Secretary, it's terribly unfair to confront you with a memo written by Mr. Altman, your underling, and not have him here to ask him what went into the memo, etc. Now, I know there's a plan to bring him back, but they should have had both of you here together. And I want to just say, I think it's, it borderlines on disgraceful the way you've been treated with this memo and with everything else, which is no reflection on your high integrity and your standards. Um, and I hope Mr. Altman will come back and we'll be able to ask him if he had any... I'll yield to the gentleman on his time. On, uh, Mr. Altman let us know at 11 o'clock last night that he wouldn't be I able to be here. So, uh, but, I understand. So I think that But I think it is out. highly unfair to ask Secretary Benson about an Altman memo that has two lines in it, that has many ways of interpretation without Altman being here with the secretary. Well, we hope to, to have Mr. Altman be back, but, uh, but, but the bottom the line is that Mr. Secretary is, was the secretary okay. of Treasury at the time. I presume that's not on my time. We'll give you an extra minute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Benson. And let me, uh, Mr. Secretary, and let me uh, say that if Mr. Altman were here today, I would ask him if he had any special expertise on Koresh, on raids and on these things, and I would bet the record would show, as it will next week, that he would say no. So he was just giving his own little guess, as a, he's a sec assistant secretary or deputy secretary, on what would happen. We don't even know what kind of tragedy he envisions here at all. Um, let me ask you, go back to the first uh, uh, round. You were in charge of, now of course, after the first raid occurred where four agents, four brave agents died, uh, you of course did know and were involved. Let me ask you this, because your reputation for integrity is unquestioned in this town, sir. Two questions. Well, the first is, do you have any doubt that the report that was done under the Treasury Department's supervision but with outside observers first was an honest and complete endeavor to get to the bottom of the tragedy? And second, do you, have you, do you have any doubts that there was no effort to slant the truth, change the truth, cover up the truth in any way? No doubt whatsoever. And let me tell you how far I went. Because I was seeking the truth at that point, too, and wanting to see what changes had to, had to be made insofar as the format of Treasury. What you saw in that situation was a group of dedicated, sincere people who had some errors in judgment, and there's no question about that, and that is cited in the report. Now, I went so far as to get some outside people to be on that review board who I thought their integrity would be unquestioned. They were Mr. Williams, who was chief of police of the Los Angeles Police Department, Mr. Henry Ruth, who was prosecutor at the Watergate hearings, and Mr. Gutman, who's a Pulitzer Prize scribe, now, here is a letter from them and what they have said. And this is dated May the 25th of this year to Speaker Gingrich. One of the many falsehoods being circulated is that ATF's actions at Waco never were investigated fully. Quite the contrary. The Treasury's critique was thorough, unsparing, and honest. More than 30 attorneys, investigators, support staff joined 10 experts in firearms, explosives, and tactical operations in a five-month probe to learn the truth. The experts were not paid, nor were we. We oversaw the investigation, participated in writing the report, which the Wall Street Journal characterized as extensively detailed and the Los Angeles Times said was courageous, candid evaluation. In addition to that, you've had four separate congressional committees that have investigated this to seek the truth. We have all worked at that, and I think that's been accomplished. Yeah, just one final yes or no question to you, Mr. Secretary. You've heard... Regular order. We've extended order. the... Oh, are we going to regular, regular order? order? 
Now, are we changing I, the rules, Mr. Chairman? You've been I, lenient with no, an extra minute, 10 no, seconds or 30 are seconds. You, are you questioning what I'm about to do? No, not yet. Are you going to let me do it? <laughs> Please. I know, I know that you're a showman from New York. Uh, I, I, I'm I said I would give the you, truth. I will give you this last question in terms of fairness. I said I'd give you an extra minute. There may be questions on my side whether I'm being too generous, but please make it short. Thank you. And I appreciate your fairness because I, like you, am trying to get at the truth. Thank and you. And what I would say, right, something you never do, Mr. Boyer. No politician ever does that. Um, you're, I would you're taking all to, of your time. I would ask you, Mr. Secretary, in the two days, you've listened to the two days of hearings that have occurred so far. To your knowledge, has any material fact any new material fact that you were unaware of before come out in these hearings? What I've heard at this point, no new material fact. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Your time has expired. I'm glad we have an open mind for looking for the truth from new material that may or may not come out or already has come out. Mr. Hyde from Illinois, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Simpson, um, do you know of anybody at Treasury who had knowledge of this raid before February 26th? No, sir, I do not. Mr. Higgins, do you know of anybody at the Treasury Department who had knowledge of this raid before February 26th? I don't know. Of, I don't know of anybody in the current administration. I believe a briefing paper went over with respect to opening the investigation sometime in, in June of '92. But I don't know of anybody in the current administration who did. But I, that doesn't mean they didn't. Well, you just don't know, then. Is that is that your answer? I hope that's what I said. Okay, Mr. Kyler. Do you know of anybody at Treasury that knew of this raid that happened on the 28th before the 26th? Knew, knew it was going to happen before the 26th? No, sir. Mr. Langan, do you know of anybody at Treasury who knew of this raid before February 26th? No, sir. And Secretary Benson, do you know of anybody at Treasury who knew of this raid before February 26th? Mr. Chairman, no, I do not know of anyone. And that's the sort of thing that had to be corrected, and that's what I set about to do, to see that it didn't happen in the future. And at some point, I'd like to have the opportunity of saying what we've done to correct it. Well, I'm sure you will be given that, and I hope you are, uh, Mr. Secretary. I well remember that uh, the newspapers and Democrats had a, had a fiesta over the fact that they let uh, President Reagan sleep one night when some very controversial event happened overseas, and they didn't wake him up. Um, but here you are in London uh, tending to monetary affairs, and I know God knows they're important, and here is a massive raid, an unprecedented raid, on a religious group out in the plains of Texas, and uh, they didn't bother to tell you about it. Um, that is something that deserves uh, looking into. Uh, I read an article by a man named Dean Kelly who is an official of the National Council of Churches, not exactly a bastion of conservatism. And he described the, uh, uh, the march on, uh, uh, on Waco. Uh, two unmarked cattle trailers drew up in front of the building at Mount Carmel and disgorged more than 70 agents dressed in dark commando costumes, complete with ski masks and carrying guns who raced toward the buildings in several groups shouting, and, and he says at some point shooting. David Koresh, unarmed, opened the front door before they reached it and called, what do you want? There's women and children in here. The lead agent claimed to have yelled, police, get down, or some such cry. And Koresh closed the door. Shortly thereafter, heavy firing broke out it says from both sides, who fired first and at what remains a matter of sharp dispute. Two teams of ATF agents with ladders mounted to the roof of the first floor and broke into the windows of the second floor where they believed the weapons were stored. They met with heavy fire, which resulted in several casualties. One team did not make an entry, but the other did. Its members were not able to advance, however, and the effort failed. Firing continued from both sides for some time with the agents pinned down behind their vehicles and other cover until a ceasefire was negotiated. I is that substantially correct, um, Secretary, from your study? No, that is not correct from Will our study. Will you tell study. me where it's incorrect? It is incorrect 
from the study insofar as who did the firing first. The claims are that claims Koresh are fired and first. and the study. You mean 70 SWAT team people were there with guns and ski masks and, and, did and not he got choose nervous to shoot and shot? First, and did not choose to shoot first. They did not shoot first. That's right. All right. But other than that, it's substantially correct. Well, I, I think it uh, From your study, your exhaustive it, study. portrays it uh, as a type of an assault, which it was not. They came to try to serve peacefully the warrants. With ski masks and, and they 70 were, SWAT And they team? were ambushed in the process. And I saw a situation of some very dedicated people, some very courageous and disciplined people, who tried to carry out the orders of what they thought was uh, the law insofar as the assembly well, of machine well, guns Secretary, and I, explosives. Yeah, I have that they did. Yeah. I saw a situation where you had a medic trying to cover and help some of the wounded and was continued to be held under fire and had a medical bag he was trying to utilize to help shot out of his hands with a 50 caliber gun. That's what they were subjected to. This same article says a mile-long convoy of 80 government vehicles with their headlights on, including two covered cattle trailers containing over 70 ATF agents in full SWAT gear, reached the staging area at Bellmead on the edge of Waco at 7.30 a.m. Two helicopters supplied by the Texas National Guard warmed up at the command center. Well, this was quite an operation, and I'm just disappointed that your people didn't let you know. Even though you were at London, there pretty good telephone and radio connections as I recall, and uh, that seems to me a shame. Well, thank you. My time is up. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. The chair now recognizes Mr. Scott from Virginia for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask Secretary Benston uh, a question. The initial raid obviously resulted in the loss of life of four agents and several of the residents. Um, what, is, what did the Department of Treasury do after this to ensure to the best of your ability that that wouldn't happen again? What I did was immediately setting up a review commission and bringing in outside experts to see just what had happened. They went into great detail. It took them some five months to complete that investigation and then report to me and to the president. In addition to that, I had the inspector general checking it to see that they were carrying out the format of the study. In that, we assembled some 17 senior investigators from the Secret Service, the Customs Service, the IRS, and the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network to assist with the interviews and the preparation of the report. And no ATF personnel took part in that review. We brought in 10 outside Treasury experts to give us further information on the tactical operations, firearms, and explosives. And all of them, like the independent reviewers, served without pay. I must say that the ATF group gave total cooperation then to this type of a review. We interviewed more than 500 individuals between May 17th and the publication of the report. And most of those interviews were done in person. The Waco report was praised for its frank accounting and analysis of events. Treasury's Inspector General, the independent reviewers, gave it that support. The media supported it as to what it had done. Now let me say corrective actions have been taken. Once it was published, numerous personnel changes were made both in Washington and in the field. The leadership at the ATF was replaced. Secret Service Director John McGall, a 34-year veteran of law enforcement and a known reformer, succeeded that position. Three ATF officials were placed on administrative lead. The Associate Director for Law Enforcement, Mr. Hartnett, the Deputy Associate Director for Law Enforcement, Mr. Conroe, and the Chief of the Intelligence Division, Mr. Troy. Two of those chose to retire. The Intelligence Chief was demoted. And the two raid commanders were relieved of their law enforcement duties. They no longer wear badges, carry guns, or supervise lion agents. These are the things that we did. Now remember, these people broke no law in their attempt to execute lawful warrants. 
They were disciplined for errors in judgment and their false and misleading statements following that raid. We certainly took the action and we learned some lessons in the process. What we have done, it revealed a pattern of inadequate oversight by Main Treasury and insufficient communication between the Office of Law Enforcement and the bureaus it's charged with supervising. We have enhanced the formal and informal communication between the Office of Enforcement and the bureaus. We now have a Treasury Law Enforcement Council, which consists of directors of each law enforcement bureau. I'm talking like I'm still secretary, sorry about that. But those are the actions that we took to try to be certain this never happened again. Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Green from Texas. I apologize for using all your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank my colleague, uh, Congressman Scott from Virginia. Mr. Secretary, I consider you my friend for many years. You had a distinguished career in this House and in the Senate and in, in, the, in the administration. I'm glad you worked it in that I was in this House, too. <laughs> for a couple of terms in the early 50s or late 40s. You understand what we're doing. Congress is Monday morning quarterbacking, and that's what our job is. These officers, ATF, doesn't want us out there on the line to make those decisions because we're not trained for that. We're looking for what has been done and what could be done to make sure it doesn't happen again. And your responses to Congressman Scott talked about the disciplining of the agents. And even yesterday, those agents who were disciplined said 70% of this report was correct. And that's from the agents who were relieved of duty and reinstated. But 70%, if I can get that from someone I discipline, that consider a winner. Let me point out that uh, our uh, honorable chairman of the Judiciary Committee talked about the agents coming out in ski masks. The witnesses at that table yesterday said there were no ski masks, none of them. Mr. Buford, who was there, and actually compared the fire that he received as a veteran of Vietnam to what he received there at, uh, at Waco. And, but there was no ski mask. So let's put that article to rest that there was no ski mask out there because we have sworn testimony to that effect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Well, let me say this who is one who's been under combat fire. I understand the courage and the discipline that was exercised by those agents. Ross Layton from Florida. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will uh, soon yield the uh, remainder of my time to Mr. Schiff, but I, uh, before I do, I confirmed this morning that my uh, NRA rating was uh, D minus last year. I don't think that the NRA considers me exactly to be a, a sterling uh, legislator on their issues. I voted on a procedural measure on the crime bill. I voted for it. Uh, the NRA was, uh, uh, was on that, uh, that side, so I ended up with a D minus and not an F. Uh, but the NRA is in, in no way, as you can imagine, tainting me uh, in this hearing. The NRA, NRA is not uh, guiding my questions. Uh, the minority uh, this morning again continues to try to divert attention uh, from the real issues uh, of the hearing, and the liberal press may play along with this uh, bashing the NRA hysteria. But this side will continue to seek out the truth uh, so that uh, government agents uh, will no longer, uh, will in any way be in uh, harm's way ever again. I'm concerned about the, this uh, misguided raid, the uh, poor supervision, the lack of uh, proper procedures uh, being followed. And those are the real issues that our side will continue to hammer away at uh, every day. And I yield the remainder of uh, my time to Mr. Schiff. I thank the lady for yielding. And I'd like to continue for a moment under the lady's train of thought here. I truly regret the President of the United States remarks that, as quoted in the paper, are that uh, the mistakes by federal law enforcement somehow excuse the depravity that took place inside the compound. I view the situation as the opposite. I think there are those that are arguing that Mr. Koresh's personal depravity somehow excuses law enforcement errors. And I want to further take a moment and say, to clarify the issue that was the subject of most of yesterday's hearing about the role of the military in law enforcement. I do so because, in addition to being a member of Congress, I have a background in military law. And I want to say I happen to agree with those who say that the Posse Comitatus Act, the federal law that restricts the federal military from engaging in, in civilian law enforcement, was not violated. I personally have not seen evidence that it was violated. But there was a serious breach of military policy that occurred. General Pickler, commander of Joint Task Force 6, 
had an anti-drug mission and an anti-drug mission only in order for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to have gotten assistance through, the, through Joint Task Force 6 that they did receive, they had to turn their mission into a firearms mission, which is what it was, according to Mr. Wisnowski, who headed the mission, into an anti-drug mission to take down a methamphetamine lab. So in other words, in order for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms to have obtained the military assistance they did receive, not because of the Posse Comitatus Act, but because of existing military policy, they misrepresented to the military that this was an anti-drug raid when it was never an anti-drug raid. With that clarification, with the time I have left, Secretary Benson, thank you for being here. I would like to ask you something, please. You stated that two supervisory agents were discharged as a result of the Treasury Department's uh, investigation, and I believe you mean Mr. Wisnowski and Mr. Sarabin. Is that right, sir? Would you give me those names again? I, I believe the, the correct pronunciation is Mr. Wisnowski and Mr. Sarabin. I believe they are the yes. two agents who were Well, they were put on administrative leave, and then it was left, uh, as I recall, to the uh, administrator uh, to take such action as was necessary. Uh, then, uh, as I recall, uh, they appealed to the, the Merit uh, Protection Board, uh, and a uh, compromise was worked out, uh, but they were denied uh, supervision of Lion officers, they lost their badges, uh, they could not carry a gun. Well, they, they were, were essentially demoted. They were essentially fired, but then reinstated under those circumstances. Is that a fair summary? Reinstated with limitations. Yes, sir. Uh, that's, that's what I meant to say. Yeah. The proceedings under which they appealed their termination and were reinstated with, with those limitations, is all of that public? Is that pub are those documents publicly available? Congressman, I don't know. I wonder if any member of the panel knows if the documents of the, of the hearing of the appeal by these terminated agents which resulted in their limited reinstatement is publicly available. Can any member of the panel answer that? All right. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I just want to say in, in the search for documents, I hope we can get a copy of those hearings also. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My time is up. Thank you. Uh, chair yields to Mrs. Collins, Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Higgins, when were you first appointed director of the uh, ATF? I acted as director from uh, 1982 until 1983. I was appointed permanent director in 1983. Were you appointed by President Reagan? Actually by the Secretary of the Treasury, but it was under the Reagan administration. Okay. During the time you served as director, what exactly did you know about the good old boys round up in Texas and Tennessee? I knew nothing about, nor did I attend as some of claimed, although I'm not sure what that had to do with this hearing. Well, I think it has a lot to do with it. And as a matter of fact, it's my understanding that the good old boy roundup was a sort of syndicated secret within the ATF. So I want, you know, to make sure, is your testimony that no one ever mentioned anything at all to you about the good old boys roundup? Is that right? Uh, that's my testimony. I remember nothing about the good old boys roundup. In 10 years, if somebody said it, you know, I'm not going to say they didn't, but I don't remember anything. I never attended. I, I certainly never heard of anything that was anywhere near any racist activity. So uh, I've submitted a statement to the Senate, which I believe is having hearings today, you that I never, know nothing about the good old boys roundup. Were you ever aware of any racist uh, and discrimination within the ATF in the 10 years that you were there, or any allegations of it by African Americans or other minorities? With respect to uh, racial discrimination within the Bureau just generally? Yes. Uh, yes, we had uh, uh, cases from time to time. I know over my 10-year career we would have people allege they were. Uh, some would be investigated and found that they had, in fact, others would be investigated and found there was no basis. There was also a group of agents who I believe now have a uh, class action lawsuit, or at least I don't, I'm not sure what the status of it is, but I think that's the case. According to an African-American uh, ATF agent, the good old boys roundup is merely a symptom of the larger problem of racism that has existed for some time within the ATF. And uh, you say that you were never at any point made aware of that kind of symptomatic racism? Yes. Well, you knew of, of cases that had uh, been uh, looked at, allegations that had been made? Yes, but I think your question is, do I think that there's some sort of symptomatic uh, system of racial discrimination within ATF? And 
that's not my understanding of what happens in ATF. Uh, the fact that someone believes it is, is certainly their right and, and can file a suit and has a, probably a... Some of a, the suits uh, were found, so, did some of the suits find that there was racism? Well, I'm sure there have been, yes. Uh, we've had suits While charging were, racial discrimination, uh, sexual discrimination, uh, a number of, of uh, cases. On your watch? On my watch and everyone else's. Not my watch anymore, but I'm sure they're still being filed. Well, while, while you were in charge? Yes. Uh huh. What steps did you take to try to erase the racism that was there while you were there? Okay. I met with the agents beginning with a small group of agents who were concerned about uh, discrimination in ATF. I think going all the way back to when I took over as director and maybe when I was deputy director. Uh, we were able to implement a lot of the things that they wanted, and I, and I hope, if they're being honest, they will admit that. We also could not completely what satisfy them. What were some of the them. things that they wanted? Uh, they wanted an ombudsman, for example, uh, to, to appoint a black agent, so if they had a problem, that person could come directly to me and make the case for them. I appointed that person to do that. Uh, I, I appointed a, a black woman as the head of the, the Office of Equal Opportunity, and, and I think if you want to question her, I think she'll uh, tell you that we had a commitment. Did we satisfy everyone? No, obviously no. Some of the critics have implied that the raid on Waco was motivated by the ATF's need for publicity and that the reasons uh, uh, sometimes vary, but the more popular version includes a desire for a high-profile event just before scheduled uh, congressional hearings and the need to draw attention away from adverse publicity that ATF feared uh, about some pending personnel complaints. Are you aware of that? Well, my short answer to people who feel that way is that's a very callous, cynical charge uh, with respect to how people who have given their life caring and being concerned about the welfare of the men, women, and children, both those inside the compound and everywhere else, to, to imply that those were the motives, I think, is a tremendous disservice to any of us who were there. Did you at uh, any time prior to the raid believe that the attempt to serve the warrant by dynamic entry was likely to lead to a gun battle and therefore casualties to ATF agents and civilians? Absolutely not. And I think the planners will tell you that in, in planning any raid plan, if any of the planners or myself believe that even one person is likely to be injured or killed, we'll look for another plan. Well, uh, time has expired. Chair yields to Mr. Coble, North Carolina. Mr. Chairman, I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Barr. Mr. Barr. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Earlier we heard that the gentleman from New York feels that there is nothing new. I think he repeated it several times. While he may believe that, and while the New York Times may agree with him, people out in the country frankly don't care what a newspaper from New York thinks about. There is important information coming out of these hearings, including information concerning directives from both the Departments of Justice and the Department of the Treasury to stop ATF's initial inquiry into what happened, what went wrong on February 28th. There are also court orders, including provisions insisted on, according to testimony yesterday, by the Department of the Treasury that documents and personnel files of two of the ATF agents intimately involved with the initial raid and which relate explicitly to that initial raid and the shooting review that was conducted or attempted to be conducted shortly thereafter be destroyed, not just removed from the personnel files with the Merit System Protection Board, but destroyed. We heard from witnesses that such a demand in a, me in a hearing like that or in a court proceeding like that by anyone, much less a department of the executive branch insisting on such a provision is not only highly unusual, but in the opinion of the witnesses yesterday, including those very familiar with MSPB proceedings, has never been heard of before. Now these things, perhaps not in the eyes of a particular newspaper or in the eyes of the congressman from New York do raise very legitimate and serious questions. And it is unfortunate that others have no concern with the directives that we have seen. What I'd like to request is if Mr. Bush could 
distribute document number 3428 and 3430, which are settlement agreements for Charles Sarabin and Philip Wisnacki before the Merit System Protection Board and referencing paragraph 14 therein, specifically that any documents in these files relating to or concerning disciplinary action will be removed and destroyed and also referencing previous language in those two settlement agreements in paragraph 12 that documents filed by the parties be withdrawn and I would especially appreciate Mr. Secretary your reviewing those particular provisions that I think I summarized accurately whether you're familiar with those and if you in fact have any knowledge of where in the Department of the Treasury the insistence that those provisions be included as part of the settlement agreements came from? Uh, my understanding is that there was no request by Treasury that records be destroyed, none, quite to the contrary to what you have stated, and that copies of the documents to which you refer uh, have been retained by Treasury and produced in these subcommittees. Okay, then uh, it, uh, if a witness as the attorney representing one of these individuals uh, yesterday testified under oath, stated that it was specifically at the directive request and demand of the Department of the Treasury that that language be included, he would be lying. I'm telling you what Treasury has advised me no, and, I, and I heard you when you said that, and I, yes. and I appreciate that. Yes. So you would say that the testimony yesterday that I've just summarized for you... I didn't you, see that, and I'd want to see that in detail. But I can tell well, you there's, that there's Treasury, no Treasury it. It absolutely his denies having such records destroyed or okay, requesting so as, that. As far as, far as you know, true. then, uh, the Department of the Treasury made no such request, demand, or insistence. That's what I've been advised. Okay. Mr. Higgins, if I could uh, direct your attention to a number of memos, and if uh, Mr. Uh, Bush, uh, if you could distribute those to uh, Mr. Higgins, numbers 18994, numbers 17722, and 19941, all of which relate to, uh, Mr. Bush, if we could get those distributed to Mr. Higgins right away, please. These uh, documents, Mr. Higgins, uh, emanate from the Department of the Treasury and oh, it's been the policy of these hearings to allow someone to finish the question and before we call them out of time no 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 sir I'm not arguing about the time I'm saying that we're hearing about a lot of documents they're not being distributed down here okay can we see that they're also distributed on on the minority okay, Mr. side Chairman, these, and these I'll hold up for a second till they are no, I was going to say, Mr. Chairman, these are documents that have been inserted already in the record on at least two occasions. I mean, you have, this side has better access to documents than we do. Mr. Chairman. My, my Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. You don't have an index. We don't. Parliamentary inquiry. Mr. Chairman, okay. Parliamentary Mr. inquiry. Mr. Barr has the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, do you have copies of those now, order. Mr. Higgins? That is regular order, Mr. Barr. Mr. Chairman, that has not been the policy of this committee. What? The policy of this committee up to this point in the process. You're out of order, to, You're out of order Mr. Okay. Barr. Demand regular order, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Higgins. Uh, what, what we've done is let, let go ahead and finish your question, and, and, and you're okay. right in the middle Mr. of it. Chairman, that has not been the policy up to this point. It has been the policy to allow the witnesses to testify. I think your own side would agree. After the red light has gone off but not to allow questions to start after Regular the red order. light has gone, has, has come on. That has not been the policy up to this point, and I object and demand regular order. Regular order has been demanded. Please finish up your question. Okay. If you could, Mr. Higgins, regarding these documents, which seem to indicate very explicitly that after the start 
of the initial shooting review, which was required, as I understand it, pursuant to ATF uh, procedures and guidelines, uh, to determine whether or not the shooting that occurred on February 28th was appropriate in accordance with regulations, etc., that after that started and Department of Justice attorneys were, were beginning to interview and ATF agents were beginning to interview people concerning that shooting review, that directives came down from, among others, Deputy General Counsel Robert Mr. McNamara Mr. Barber, directing please, please. that witnesses not be interviewed, that they be ceased, and that no notes be taken. Could you explain why such directives were given? I can't. I, I know who McNamara, is, McNamara, I guess it is, is, but I have no idea why he gave that instruction or direction. I think is, he'd be the best person standard, to ask. standard procedure? Mr. Conyers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm delighted to see the uh, former secretary here. Uh, wish him well in his new endeavors. Uh, could you review for us, Secretary Benson, the, the whole question of uh, racial discrimination and activities related to the old boy uh, roundup that was so embarrassing? I've talked with this uh, to Secretary Rubin, who will be testifying here uh, very shortly. And what uh, I see as very important in the, the members of the Congressional Black Caucus and many of our friends in the Congress is that we make sure, since uh, Waco had to have been gone into uh, something that we did not think was necessary, uh, parenthetically, uh, we have the awful Oklahoma City bombing, and out of that comes a hearing on Waco as opposed to a hearing on the militiamen, uh, many of these dangerous armed organizations that are existing around the country. But nevertheless, this, this question has to be addressed and moved forward on. And I'd like you to relate to us any information and any activities that you may have uh, help put forward to promote better policies to end the discrimination in race relations that has been endemic in many of our law enforcement organizations. We've been fighting, I have in judiciary, have been fighting the problem of oppressive racial activity within the FBI, the Immigration and Naturalization Service, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, the Drug Enforcement Administration uh, for many, many years. And I think that this would be a good opportunity for us to discuss this uh, from your frame of experience in the Treasury. Mr. Congressman, one of the first votes that I cast in this body, in the House, was in 1949 to do away with the poll tax. And I'll tell you, there are only two in the whole Texas delegation voted that way. And that was like blood on the moon in those days. So I have a long history of support of civil rights and opposition to racial intolerances. That's my rearing. And that's been my legislative record. And I supported that as Secretary of the Treasury. And if you look at the gentleman that's the Assistant Secretary of Treasury enforcement. It's a man who belongs to the minority. And that's one of the most critical positions in Treasury today, to try to see that we do not have racial discrimination. I think what I've seen of the pictures of these meetings is absolutely outrageous. Certainly has no support of any kind by Treasury, none. Well, I uh, would have expected you to say that, uh, knowing you for many years. The problem that uh, I'm confronted with, Secretary Benson, is the fact that the old boy roundup, which wasn't the first one that occurred, uh, that happened this year, is really something I consider to be symptomatic of an environment 
rather than the problem. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, all of the officials in uh, ATF are going to make sure that that never occurs again. And by the way, there were other law enforcement officers present that were not ATF. There were some from FBI and other parts of our government. But what I think we need to emphasize is excising that tragic activity that occurred in Tennessee uh, from any future occurring again doesn't change the environment out of which it grew. And that, to me, is a very deep concern. That is to say that where this could flourish, uh, there may and must be other kinds of practices that need to be rooted out within the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Uh, we need to look more carefully. And we'll be talking with Ron Noble about this, a good friend of mine. But the fact of the matter is that uh, pulling one weed out of the, the lawn doesn't mean that uh, we're not going to have any more problems. And what I need to do and, and want to make sure that ATF and everybody else in every law enforcement operation understands is that we've got to go to the, the environment. Well, I'll say you that my successor, that? Se Secretary Rubin, has launched an IG investigation, and that in turn will be reviewed by an outside board of inquiry. Time has expired. And I, I would just like to, at this point, clarify the chair's policy on, on time. And I think uh, that was a good example. You were in the middle of asking a question. We gave you an extra almost minute to finish it. It was a good thought. Uh, I would like to just make a comment that, that uh, those management practices that, that you were questioning, we are trying to question, too. We're trying to get at the bottom. What led to the core of some bad decisions, whether it be racial problems or roundup stuff or decisions to go in and not to go in. These are the things that we're trying to do, and I, I, I credit the gentleman for his comments. Thank the chairman. Uh, and we, as, we, as, we, as we know, Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Secretary Rubin will be here to, yeah. to testify. I, I just would like to say what I was trying to do is, is that if it's a question such as what you made, it's my intention to let you continue to finish your question. It's also my intention to let the panel uh, answer that question within reason. Now, if anybody on this side of the aisle, and I'd, I'd certainly be willing to listen to uh, Mrs. Thurman, uh, Mr. Schuler, you, or Mrs. Collins, anybody has a complaint that think we're being dealing unfairly, then no. we'd be happy to deal with no, it. No, I, th I thank you very much. Uh, for Please state the your nature of your inquiry. Uh, if, if the rules are not being uh, complied with, uh, doesn't any member on the panel have the right to raise that? Yes. Uh, then do you distinguish uh, further parliamentary inquiry between a question that is in process when the red light comes on and a question that starts after the red light comes on, which no. is exactly I, what I have I been think, doing. I think what I we're have trying not interrupted anybody who started a question before the red light came on. Mr. Boss started his question after the red light came on. I disagree with not, you, my friend. Not during the time that the red light... We're trying. I, I think I opened myself up by saying that I mentioned four of your leadership over here. If anybody thinks we're dealing with it unfairly, I'd be happy to sit down with them. At this point, I'd like to recognize Mr. Boyer from Indiana. Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing... I, uh, I'm going to yield to, to a friend from Florida, but I want to make a, a comment quickly. One is that, that does bother me, and it was some of the comments from, uh, from Mr. Schumer yesterday and when I read the, the Washington Post today about the President's comments about no moral equivalency is the ends, the ends does not justify the means. The ends does not justify the means. I think it's important to note that I think David Koresh was a very bad person, ugly, could try, be tried for murder, firearms, child molestation. But this whole this thing about ends justify the means is not the how we, way we conduct a civil process and criminal process. And I think, Secretary Benson, that's why you, you set about with great sincerity for your investigation, because I know you, you're a man of integrity and you don't believe that ends justifies the means of my following of you over the years. The, the, the uh, one thing I, I do have a question, though, for it, Mr. Benson, is that 
Uh, earlier in a question, you said that uh, you have heard of no new material facts uh, from this hearing. Uh, we've had, uh, during the first day, we went almost 12 hours. The second day, we went about 12 hours. Did you sit and listen to all of these hearings? <laughs> no, I certainly did not. I said with what I heard, I had not. And, and how much of these hearings have you heard? Uh, fortunately, not a lot. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, not a lot. Well, I think that's very important to clear up. I yield to the gentleman from Florida. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Boyer, for yielding. Uh, I'd like the memorandum that Mr. Cooler to Mr. Langan passed out to them. I believe the, all the members of the committee have that memorandum, if we could. Um, this is the memorandum I referred to earlier, Mr. Kuehler. You prepared uh, and you told us that you submitted to Mr. Langan on the 26th of February before the raid. As I recall in your testimony earlier, you indicated that to your knowledge this was the first time that Treasury officials had been notified of the raid itself. Uh, tell us what your role, your title was in position at the time, what Mr. Langan's was. Can you tell us that? Yes, sir. I was ATF's liaison to the Department of Treasury. And Mr. Langan was, at, at, on February 26, I believe he was the acting deputy assistant secretary. And after you submitted that, well, before that, I ask you that, who provided you with the information in the memorandum? I gathered this information from a briefing I attended on February 11th from Mr. Hanoski, Mr. Sarabin, Mr. Aguilera. And, and at whose direction did you prepare the memo? at no one's direction. I prepared it myself. On February 26th, it was very difficult to uh, get in to see people at Treasury because that is the day the World Trade Center bombing occurred and they were quite busy checking on. There was a lot of Treasury assets up in New why, York. Well, why did you wait till February 26th to uh, prepare a memorandum and submit to Mr. Langan? The, uh, why did you wait to that date to, uh, to notify them? I was directed by my associate director at the time, Mr. Hartnett, to brief them that day. That is also the day that the change occurred, moving it from March 1st to February 28th. Right. So right. nothing was final prior to that time. All right. And at, at some point, did you brief uh, Mr. Simpson and Mr. Langan about the raid personally? Yes, I did. What precipitated that? Uh, I had spoken to Mr. Noble, and Mr. Noble indicated to me he appreciated the briefing, but he was in a designee capacity and had no operational authority and directed me to brief Mr. Simpson and that I might also mention it to Mr. Steiner and All right. Mr. Deal. Thank you. Mr. Simpson, uh, uh, what, uh, no, before I do that, Mr. Higgins, I want to ask you, why, uh, could, could you tell us, uh, uh, since this was the largest raid in, in ATF history, why you as the director did not personally inform the Treasury Department officials that this, this was the only way this information apparently got there, other than the original notice in 92 or whatever? Well, everyone likes to say they were out of town. I was out of town for the week immediately preceding the raid. When I got back on Friday the 26th, almost just in passing, I said, well, I assume somebody has notified Treasury because the raid was, had been moved up. All right. uh, they said they would check and find out and found out they had but not. But you chose not to earlier either. What were the defects, Mr. Simpson, in Mr. Kuehler's memorandum that led Mr. Noble uh, to advise you, and I presume you did then subsequently act on that advice, concurrent or whatever, to cancel uh, the raid, and I understand you did it at the beginning, Council, and then reinstate it. What were the defects that you saw in that memorandum you have in front of you? Or the considerations? Well, um, Mr. Chairman, we, uh, we had a, a bit of a discussion with it, Mr. Noble and I, and also Stan Morris, who was an advisor to Mr. Noble and had been head of the U.S. Marshal Service. Uh, they had very strong views on, on the, uh, on, with respect to the ATF proposal. Uh, and they also had substantially more experience in this area than I did. Uh, so out of deference to the strength of their views and the, the long experience that they had in this area, uh, I called Mr. Higgins and, and told him to cancel the raid. So there's nothing particularly in the memo itself. It was the advice that you got. That's correct. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Watts from North Carolina for five minutes. I was told by your side, Mr. Lantos, that the time was to be given to Mr. Watts. You'll be next. Mr. Chairman, I yield, I yield uh, two and a half minutes to Mr. Green and two and a half minutes to Mr. Schumer. Thank my colleague from North Carolina for yielding me the time. Mr. Secretary, yesterday my colleague from Georgia, Mr. Barr, talked about a settlement agreement between Mr. Sarabin and the Department of Treasury.
And if I believe he gave you a copy of this this morning. Yes, uh, I have and, not uh, had an opportunity to read it, though, with the okay. question going on. Let me direct your attention, and it probably would have been better to ask the attorney yesterday for Mr. Sarabin, who handled his case <laughs> um, with the Merit System Protection Board. But on page 6, I think the concern that Mr. Barr has is uh, on the fifth line, it says, any documents in these files relating to or concerning disciplinary action we removed and destroyed. And your testimony this morning said that there was no request from Treasury for that. I guess I was looking at this and reading the totality of the document, and particularly with item 15. Um, have you ever heard of a Merit System Protection Board having the authority to remove or destroy documents that were involved in a criminal proceeding? Congressman, I, I really have no detail okay. on that. I guess that's what, uh, what's happening today, where, and, and I've watched the last two days, their documents being given to people and asking to respond to them without even having time to read them ahead of time, and this is a great example of that. But after you maybe read it for a day or so, you can, you can refresh your memory, or if, even if this, you don't have a memory on it because it never came to your attention. So I, I must, guess I that's must say, the I never, that never received the detail of that. I think that's the concern that some of us have in watching the, the questions that are being asked and documents being asked for responses, and they're being asked to witnesses who, who really have no ability to respond to these documents, and maybe we should have the real people, and again, the ones who could, like the attorney for Mr. Serebin, who could have discussed that yesterday. I'll yield back my time to my colleague. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Thank you. And now let me just take my time. I just, uh, I felt it was appropriate to comment. And I'd simply say that Mr. Barr, as a U.S. attorney, ought to know better. And I find, I find it just amazing that he would do this. We all know that it is standard operating procedure that when there is a criminal investigation, potential criminal investigation, the Department of Justice routinely goes in and asks the other agency involved not to investigate for the very purpose of not tainting the information. Isn't that correct, Mr. Secretary? That's correct. It's been the policy under George Bush. It's been the policy when Mr. Barr was U.S. Attorney. It's been the policy under Ronald Reagan. And it was the policy in the first year of the Clinton administration. Let me say that if Treasury had investigated itself or ATF had investigated, we would hear that the, that the fox is invading the chicken coop, that the, the potentially guilty are investigating themselves. So to, for justice to call in and do a criminal and say, as they routinely do, that please stop the investigation. My guess is that when Mr. Barr was the U.S. Attorney, justice issued orders like this in his jurisdiction many, many, many times. And so I want to clear the air here. I hope that this is just an oversight, a mistake, not any intentional attempt to throw the word cover-up out when it had nothing to do with the cover-up, and it's something that Mr. Barr undoubtedly executed many times or several times in his jurisdiction when he was U.S. Attorney. But we always, you can have your time, sir. I just thought I had to do this. But we always, it is standard operating procedure that when a federal agency might be criminally liable, that the Department of Justice comes in and says, please don't you look at it, we will look at it under Reagan, under Bush, under Clinton. And let's not again have some of these wild allegations floating in the air that are not an attempt to get at the facts, but are at the attempt to besmirch the men and women of law enforcement. I thank the gentleman's gentleman time has expired. His time. Mr. Shattuck from Arizona has five minutes. Mr. Chairman, while I have a number of questions for this panel, at this time I will yield my five minutes to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Secretary, uh, I, in that, going back to the Roger Altman letter um, and, and just the, the, uh, in, in, a, in your testimony as a result of that, um, can I, let me just ask you one question. Did you, in fact, read in detail the Treasury re report? The 501 pages. All in total detail. No, I have not read it in total detail. I've read summaries of it. I've had, uh, and I've read uh, those parts that I thought were pertinent. I've read in detail. 
Well, I just would like to express my concern that no one really uh, felt it was important enough to chase you down and let you know it was coming up. Um, and that is doubly concerned when Mr. Higgins says that he was out of town. Um, and what are you referring to now? Well, in, in terms of being notified on, on the raid itself on the 28th, on the 28th? Well, I am sure under those conditions that they did not anticipate uh, that they would have the results they did. I think they felt uh, that uh, they would be able to accomplish the task, you know, without the killing of people. I guess, uh, I and guess one concern. Of course, concern. I was overseas, as I have told you, right. involved in an international conference with the G7 ministers at that point. I guess one concern I had, I saw the expression on your face when they mentioned the two agents that were fired and later rehired. Um, it didn't seem to me that you were aware who they were. Oh, yes. I, the names, I did not understand the pronunciation of them. But right. the field commanders, I certainly did understand what happened in that regard. And what they finally ended up with was being stripped of their badges, of their firearms, and the supervision of in-line inspectors. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Mr. Higgins, uh, Mr. Hartnick uh, said before this, uh, these committees, a substantial part of the Treasury report was not accurate. What is your view, and what exact points would you like to bring out? Well, I know how Mr. Hartnett feels, because I think personally that he was uh, not treated fairly by that report, nor was Mr. Conroy, who was his immediate assistant, because I think there are people attributed it uh, disagreements with their management styles with, with questions of integrity, and I find them to be a very high integrity. Somebody over here said they, uh, the, someone yesterday said the report was about 70 percent accurate. I mean, I, I well, think what, that's what probably right, but I didn't see a cover-up to it. Are you <laughs> handicapping it? What percentage would you give? Well, I might have given it a little higher than that. There are 72. things wrong with it, but I, yeah, I just want to point out, I think the review was comprehensive. I think they asked for every document and looked at everything. The fact that the way I'm characterized in there, that I don't agree with everything in there. I don't think people should necessarily think is unusual, but I, I, you know, we don't have time for me to give you all what the things I think. What one single thing do you think is most outrageous about that report in terms of inaccuracy? I, I think the allegation that there was somehow within ATF's top management some desire to, res to keep from the public uh, what happened and why we made the mistake and why we went ahead with the raid. It, it shows in there that this was a conspiracy of ATF top officials to keep the public from knowing. I mean, I was there, and I know that's not a fact, so I, I, obviously I disagree with that portrayal. Did you feel that Sarabin and, and, and Chernovsky had been treated unfairly? Yes, I thought they should not have been fired. I think they should have been reassigned from a management position, uh, certainly with benefit of hindsight. I, I think, and I, the panel may agree after what they've seen, uh, they probably should have called it off, but they didn't. But I don't, I don't think that's a firing offense. I think Let, that's a question of, of judgment. They should be supervisors, not supervisors, but somewhere else. Let me ATF. read you one thing. Uh, right. According to the Treasury report, and I quote, by Friday evening, however, Treasury officials permitted the operation to proceed after ATF Director Stephen Higgins addressed the Treasury's concerns that the operation could be executed safely and assured that those directing the raid were under express orders to cancel the operation if they learned that its secrecy had been compromised or if those in the compound had departed from their established routine in any significant way, unquote. The question is, in the meeting on February uh, 26, Friday, 1993, what were the main Treasury concerns? As I recall, there were two Treasury concerns. First of all, what was going to be the role of state and local agencies in terms of either providing perimeter assistance or how were they going to be involved. The second was how is the National Guard going to be involved. I got the information and gave it to Mr. Simpson. Uh, he didn't seem satisfied with that information and, and, and I've worked with John for a long time. I could read that he just, you know, just something was in the back of his mind. And that's finally when he said, well, I don't think you should go ahead with it anyway. And, but, you, but you did. Well, what I did is I called Mr. Hart and said, Treasury says, let's don't go forward with it. We discussed it. Obviously, there was some disappointment because we thought this was probably going to be the last time to do it safely with surprise. Uh, we thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My time has run out. Mr. Lantos, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Secretary, I would like to repeat on the part of those of us who feel strongly about the extraordinary public service you have rendered this country in war and in peace, our apologies for your being sworn in. This institution runs on tradition and civility.
and this was severely breached this morning, for which I want to extend to you my sincere apologies. Uh, I would like to make a couple of Thank observations much, and Mr. just ask one question. Because I think it's important these hearings be put in perspective. If a person were to arrive from the moon and would watch the proceedings and listen to television in the United States this week, he would think that the two burning issues that preoccupy us are O.J. Simpson and David Koresh, which is a commentary on the priorities that some choose to place on the issues facing this nation. Now, uh, the notion that, uh, that uh, public officials fiddle while Rome burns is not a, not a new notion, but this is a particularly poignant example of that. I also am struck, uh, Ms. Secretary, by the fact that uh, after 12 years of the Reagan and Bush administration, you had taken office just a few weeks before or almost concurrently with the February raid. Isn't that correct, sir? Yes, just a uh, When were you sworn prior. in, Ms. Secretary? When were you sworn in, do you recall? I was sworn in, um, I believe, about January the 20th, approximately. Well, the administration came in on January 20th, so it couldn't have been before well, that. So it was very soon thereafter. So basically, basically yeah. you were in office for one month after approximately. a 12-year rule by another administration involving your department. Uh, I also think that the notion uh, that one of my colleagues indicated that uh, you can be telephoned in London is about as irrelevant as anything I've heard in these hearings. You were preoccupied with major international economic trends and issues that were impacting on this nation. And uh, this clearly was handled at a lower level. Um, I also want to commend you uh, for having uh, presided over a Treasury Department study, because clearly thus far, despite all the efforts, nothing new of significance has emerged. And so far I have to uh, conclude that these hearings are a frivolous waste of taxpayers' money. Now my question uh, to you, Mr. Secretary, is let, rather let me, basic. Let me also say, Mr. Lantos, that uh, uh, then I returned on Sunday and, uh, of course, uh, when the unanticipated happened, uh, I was advised of and course. became very involved. And uh, as I recall, uh, that night was up a good part of the night conferring with ATF and, and the rest of the officials. I'm sure you were. The question I'd like to raise, Ms. Secretary, goes beyond the immediate focus of this study, but is directly related to it. Some of us are profoundly concerned by a concerted assault by the far right, militias and otherwise, to undermine public confidence both in law enforcement agencies and in our government at large. As one of the most respected senior statesmen that this nation is fortunate to have, I'd like you to give us your views of whether this represents a threat to the very functioning of a democratic and open society, when segments encouraged by segments of the media, talk radio, are undermining the very respect we all must share for our institutions, including law enforcement agencies. Congressman, I have committed uh, most of my life to public service and feel very strongly about that in hopes that uh, I could make a difference. And I commend this institution for people that serve. I have a nephew who ran for office this time. I tried to discourage him from running. I said, it's a tough life that you lead. One of the interesting things about this country of ours is that it has continued to grow and to prosper. And the standard of our living of our people has continued to improve. And although we hear all of these caustic and critical remarks about our institutions, our law-serving officers, congressmen, senators, the executive branch, all you have to do is travel around the world a bit and compare this country with those others.
and how grateful you are of what we have been able to accomplish over these 200 plus years. That we have to keep that perspective in balance. The successes we have. Are we above criticism? Of course not. We have to be uh, subject uh, to criticism of mistakes that all of us make from time to time. But overall, it's a great system, and I treasure it, and it has meant so much to all of us, I think. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired, and Thank I you, think Mr. there are many Secretary. of us uh, sitting up here that certainly agree with your last comments. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Shabbat from Ohio has five minutes. Thank you. Before I yield to the gentleman from Florida, I'd like to make a brief statement. Uh, our goal in these hearings from the beginning is to get to the bottom of what actually happened at Waco, what's the truth, and let the chips fall where they may. How can we avoid the loss of both law enforcement's lives and injuries and civilians, particularly innocent children, so this type of thing never happens again? The other side, I suspect with the full cooperation of the White House, it seems has been intent on trying to spin a message of the day. Now, the first day, the message seemed to be that Koresh was a monster. And I agree. He was a very evil child molester, very dangerous man. Yesterday, the message seemed to be that whatever happened, it certainly does not justify firing on law enforcement officials. I agree completely with them there as well. However, today's message seems to be that we've learned no new facts. We're hearing it over and over again on the other side. With that, I completely disagree. Much has been learned, much will be learned in these hearings, and we owe it to the American public to do so. I now yield to the gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. Uh, Mr. Langan, I'd like to ask you a question. At the point in time when I assume you received uh, both the memorandum and then later got briefed by Mr. Kuehler, uh, I gather that, that you at some point subsequent to that uh, initial briefing about the fact the raid was going to go on, and I, again, I assume this is the first time you learned of the raid, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, that you and Mr. Noble and Stanley Morris had a meeting to discuss this, is that correct? Yes. And as a result of that meeting, you made a recommendation, or the three of you did in some form, to Mr. Simpson uh, not to go forward with the raid at that point in time? That's correct, Congressman. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a number of concerns were evinced and we recommended to Mr. Simpson, who was acting, that the raid not progress. He, he was acting uh, for sec Secretary, Secretary of the Treasury at that point, Mr. Vincent's absence. What did you specifically conclude was, the, was wrong with this? Why didn't you want to go forward? What was the red flag or two or three or whatever you, you had in your mind? The day was a difficult one. We had uh, the World Trade Center explosion. We had concerns about our customs and our Secret Service people who were missing at that time, and almost uh, coterminous with that information coming to us, uh, we received a notification, a brief uh, uh, notice of a raid that would take place two days later. Based on what was able to be read, there wasn't uh, sufficient information to make an adequate judgment about it, but what seemed clear was that there were elements described that were dangerous. Like what? That there were weapons uh, at Mount Carmel, that there were people in the building with criminal records who may be violent. All right. Please proceed. And the result of that uh, oversight on our part was to check with ATF to get more information from the Bureau about the necessity of the raid, which uh, we did and which Mr. Higgins provided. Now, Mr. Simpson, you're the one who got more information about this raid. You initially called it off, then Mr. Higgins talked to you again. You had conversations about it. What persuaded you to go forward with this raid and authorize it uh, a day or so later? Would you use the microphone, please? Yes, sir. Um, um, Mr. Chairman, I um, had, an, had initially uh, not had reservations about this option. Uh, well, let, let me begin that. I, I initially had reservations, did not form a judgment, thought about it for an hour, and decided that all things considered, the ATF proposal with all its potential liabilities was probably the best option available. 
Uh, after talking to Mr. Noble and Mr. Morris and hearing the, uh, the advice they gave based on their extensive expertise, uh, I changed my mind and called Mr. Higgins back and asked him to call it off. Subsequently, Mr. Higgins called me and I got Mr. Noble at a restaurant and brought him into the conversation. And he gave us both additional reasons that had not previously been called to our attention. What? Um, the fact that, that there was a series of newspaper articles beginning that uh, would alert people in the compound to the possibility of a raid. Uh, the fact that there was an undercover agent inside uh, who would be able to alert ATF uh, if anything inside, the, in, in, anything inside the compound changed. And the fact that on Sunday morning there was a, apparently a ritual uh, during which the men, and, uh, the men were separated from the women and children and the weapons were locked up and that that was an opportune time for this raid to occur. Uh, given those three pieces of information, uh, with some hesitation, Mr. Noble and I uh, acquiesced in the ATF proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. Uh, the, there is a series of votes coming up. Uh, we will proceed to Mr. Wise for his five minutes. But at the completion of that, we will take a recess until the completion of those votes, uh, five minutes beyond the completion of that series of votes. Mr. Wise from West Virginia, you have five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to make one quick point echoing Mr. Schumer's point about the Department of Justice practice. In four years of chairing a subcommittee for the Government Operations Committee overseeing the Department of Justice and all of its agencies, it was always my experience under the Bush administration, and that was my tenure of chairing that subcommittee, it was always my experience that when Department of Justice had a pending criminal prosecution or investigation, they shut everybody down. They not only shut their agency down as far as contact with Congress, but they shut other agencies down in terms of our ability to get information from them, uh, whether at the U.S. attorney level or at, the, or at main justice. I think that ought to be in the record. Uh, the second thing, Mr. Secretary, if I could just ask you quickly, uh, and I think Mr. Langan actually pointed this out, at the time you were coming back from the G7 uh, international conference, there was also another significant ATF uh, procedure going on, was there not? Yes, you had the World uh, Trade Center explosion at that time. And ATF was busily investigating that. No question about and that. And that was, as I recall, that was the main item on yes. everybody's uh, media agenda at the time and, and, uh, and grabbing everyone's attention. Mr. Higgins, I'd like to follow up on the questions that were just addressed to Mr. Simpson because I think as Mr. Simpson related why he uh, acquiesced to your advice, I think it would be very helpful for the, this committee to hear why it was that you advised him for the raid to go forward um, uh, as you did. With, and I'd just like to note that the, uh, a former questioner on the other side had raised questions about whether people in ski masks and whether it was necessary to have 70 people charging across the field or whatever. I think the question about ski masks has been dealt with, uh, the issue about that, that there were none. But um, why not just have an agent go to the front door and knock on it and say, I have a warrant to serve on David Koresh? Did you consider that? Yes, in fact, I, I remember Secretary Benson asking me that question about a month later. I told him to have done that would have been to, to send that uh, agent to his execution, the way David Koresh felt about ATF and its agents. So, and I think maybe somebody on the panel may have asked it, one of the agents yesterday what he would have thought if he would have walked up there with a warrant and said, I'm from ATF and I'm here to help you. Yes, sir, and I, but that, I think it's important that that question be asked at every level. Okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to be flippant because no. it's a serious issue. But, but if you would recount uh, the factors that led you to advise Mr. Simpson uh, to continue with the raid. Absolutely. When I, when I called back, after I talked with Mr. Simpson the first time, I called Mr. Hart and said, let, let's shut it down. But, uh, let me go back one step before that. What we sent over there was never intended to be an information plan for them to approve or disapprove. It was simply a notice. There was no requirement that they approve. In fact, for the 11 years that I worked as director, we never got approval for any. And I don't know that justice does it any differently. But that was simply to be information. So I knew that John didn't have all the information. When I called Mr. Hartnett and said, please shut it down, he said, well, there's a couple of things that have come up. One is the paper is going to run this article starting Saturday. So we're going to try, we, we would have moved the rate up till Sunday. Once it's run, because of the things that are going to be in there, it's going to identify probably some of our informants, uh, which would make it dangerous for them. This is probably going to be the last time that we can execute, execute a surprise plan. After that point, David Korsh is going to be ready and waiting. Uh, how about, and he, he's the one who came up with the proposal, 
How about we send somebody in on Saturday and Sunday and let them see if there's anything unusual? Getting a little dry. Anyway, uh, I said, that sounds like a good suggestion. I called John Simpson back, made that as an alternative proposal, and it, he said, okay. And indeed, was that what Agent Rodriguez was doing? Mm -hmm. That's exactly what he was doing. I thank you. I yield back, back my time. Thank you. Uh, we, uh, the chair, will uh, call a recess until five minutes after these series of votes. You're watching the third day of hearings before the House Judiciary and Government Oversight Subcommittees. We'll return in a moment, but first some program information. Educators use C-SPAN's coverage of timely public affairs events as a teaching tool in a variety of subjects. Our